everybody. Welcome back to Fury Craft. Nice to have you back if you're already a uh, subscriber here. And if you're new here, welcome. I'm Jack. And over on this side is Ben, my co-host. And on my shoulder, we got Boris and we got Minogi, who like to butt in and rant and ramble with us as we do this talking spiel, whatever you want to call this, moan, whatever, where we do anything on comic books, movies, series, TV series, and all sorts like that, as that's what we enjoy, and that's why this channel exists in the first place, but mostly to moan. And without further ado, this one is going to be on one of my favourite topics, and very near and dear to our hearts, as I think that British comedy has a magic, which seems to be, in my opinion, the best. Mm -hmm. As you, as with British comedy, it's so raw, so visceral, but it's not the same as it once was back in like the 70s, 80s, 90s. And um, we're going to go through a bunch of our favourite ones, hopefully a short and sweet episode, but we always say that and it usually ends up ranting for about an hour or so. But we'll hopefully try and get through these uh, as best we can. And without further ado, let's get ready to ramp, brother. That was my best impression of Hulk Hogan right there. Anyway. So under this one, we're going to have, uh, have just a few of our favorite ones. So, Ben, if you had to pick like your top three, if you want to go do one, then I will. What would you yeah. say is probably some of your favorite uh, British comedy TV series that you just love? So my top pick for one of my top three is Blackadder. It was yes. a beloved series throughout the centuries of random historical moments it wasn't completely accurate but then again most of history is a bit bonkers anyway but the thing is for me i fell in love with it purely for the fact that while i was studying my gcse history we watched it as a way of looking into the past as like what wasn't and what was true and we watched the final version of blackadder which was blackadder goes forth and there's a lot of characters in it which are definitely something different. And I think the one that always got me was Stephen Fry, who went... Be <laughs> because it, <laughs> it was just the fact that he was... Stephen Fry is a very well-spoken man, as it already is. But the fact that he went even more, I say, Jolly D, Chad, Hosa sort of voice made it even more bonkers than it already was. Yeah, but an interesting fact is that the guy that played his secretary, sort of like assistant, was the character's name was Darling, and the thing that the character had that every time that Stephen Fry just went and go went Darling, that he would have a twitch. But the problem was that after so many years of doing it, he actually started forming a twitch. The actor in real life, when someone went Darling. Oh, really? It took him a good two years for him to get a, sort of adjusted back to reality. But I think one thing that you will love is the fact that he, in the whole spoke of Blackadder, while he wasn't a common actor in it, he was in it once every so often, Rick yeah. Mail was in it from Bottom. Yeah, you had quite a few famous actors that were in it, which I never even noticed till I was like going back on like a few of the IMDb and like past acts and everything going, Rick May was in it? And then I yeah. had to go back on YouTube and try and see if I could find the episode. And like, lo and behold, there's Rick May. But the thing is, his character was the same like person to a degree. It was just his ancestors throughout the series called Lord F Flash Harp. And of course, ever since the Queen song Flash came out, that's how he was introduced. It was Flash! Ah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was <laughs> unbelievably obscurely obnoxious character. The first time that you meet him is Blackadder second, I think, where he's like a lord of some kind. Yeah. And he's just about to get married. And then of course he's the best man to Blackadder. Comes in, I say, Blackadder, who's she? And snogs his wife and goes, that's the woman I'm about to marry, Lord Flashard. I say, Jolly D. And it's just like, oh my, it gets, it's such a bonkers series. How they got away with a lot of it, I will never know. I know. Now that's the beauty with a, a lot of these series. That a lot of the series that I love so much, I don't reckon a lot of it could be done today because you got all the, because you got all the snowflakes that like to moan about everything so we're not allowed nice things. 
The thing is, like, British comedy, while there has been a lot of iffy moments where certain people have implied certain things, it was in a different time where people were, I wouldn't say accustomed to that way of talking, but more able to find the funniest side to it. And they were able to just hear it and just move on from there. Exactly. Like that there are certain moments that obviously are more iffy than others, but then again, it has happened in modern comedy since, and while it has been labelled as a bad idea, the art of common sense would be that we just move on and allow the joke to surpass. But Exactly. Yeah. And plus if what people seem to forget and don't seem to take note of it's just a series or it's just a film. Get over it. Yeah. And not and plus like comedy and everything is subjective. Like some people like dad jokes, some people hate them, some people don't have a dark sense of humor, whereas me, I do have a dark sense of humor. <laughs> but you know, it's just it's subjective. Well, this is it. But what's gonna be your first pick of the list? Uh this one. I just there was only three series of it, and I wish they'd done more. But I encourage all of you to watch the live shows because to me they're funnier than the series because in the live shows when you had, um, it's not a spin-off of the young ones. It's a completely different series, but with Rick Mail, Ed Edmondson, Bottom, we, uh, Rick Mail was Richie, Eddie, uh, Ed Edmondson was Eddie. And like they have like this whole like interesting kind of life together where like they're basically their mission in life is just to kill one another and to piss each other off as much as they possibly can. And you just have to watch the series. It's too much for me to get into here because it's different things throughout each episode, but it's all brilliant. It's all funny. And See, like you had the live shows, which were the live shows they could get away with a lot more because a lot of them like weren't taped. There was only a few of them, which were like the last show of the tour or something like that. And the amount of stuff they could get away with, like there was a whole segment that Richie had in uh, the first bottom live uh, tour where his whole shtick was trying to shag the queen. <laughs> and honestly, you have to just watch it. To... Oh no, it's in the second series, sorry, when he's like, his whole thing was like, the, the whole theme throughout the whole show was that he was trying desperately to lose his virginity to the queen. And then they end up getting tossed in prison uh, for like 490 years or something like that. It's just absolutely brilliant. And the stuff they could get away with on the live shows was brilliant. And the audience loved it. But that's definitely one of my main favourite series. I always love watching. See, the thing is, when you say about the fact that they more often not spend time to try and kill one another, I don't know if it's just my imagination, but I see that as a way of it being almost like an adult version of Tom and Jerry. Like, they're frenemies to a degree. They will hatch plans together if they have to, but more often than not, they're against each other and trying to find wacky and weird ways it, to just do things. It's, it's like a slapstick comedy at its very best. And, like, honestly, Bottom, if you've never watched it, you have to watch it. It is fantastic. It's brilliant. The live shows especially are just brilliant yeah see i saw some of the clips from the live show and there's one where uh eddie says to rick like oh we've got a script this year have we and he just oh, completely we, this year, have we? <laughs> we he just completely loses it because i think it's like the best part of 10 minutes he's trying to f remember the lines or something he's completely lost the like plot of the script or yeah. whatever and they're stuck on a desert island but he just couldn't get himself back to that logic yeah, there was like there was one there was one particular scene in uh, the second tour which they did, which I think was in '96, I think, and uh, around the year I was born. And um, there they had like a I'm not gonna I'll try and like summarize this best I can, but they had a para that Richie was looking after for the vicar, and basically like they managed to escape from prison and everything like that. They make it back to the flat, and they make this plan to try and fake their own death so the police, when they come after him, will think they've died in a massive explosion in their flat. And the parrot starts telling Eddie, that's a really crap plan, it's never going to work. And he pulls out a gun and she points it at the parrot and goes, it's a fake parrot, by the way. Yes. And we're just saying, I don't think you've got an effing say in it, mate. And uh, <laughs> that's just a certain bit in the, in in the entire thing where... Um, he's just pointing the parrot and we point the guy at the parrot he's like 
I'm going to like, come on, make my day. But I tell you what, in all the excitement of Richie forgetting most of his effing lines again, <laughs> because that's it became like a shtick because Rick Mayo in the live shows was terrible at remembering a lot of his lines, but mm. they made a whole angle out of it, which is what, because they screwed up so much, it made it funnier. Mm. It's just, it, I've seen some of it and it's such a bizarre series. Like, it's, I think it's the brutality of them, like, trying to kill each other half the time. It's such... Like, it's frying like, pans, like, a chainsaw to the nuts. Like, yes. <laughs> like, it's not really slapstick. It's, like... I'm trying to think, like, the best combination of words. It's, like, saw meets, like, Tommy Cooper comedy. Like, it's brutal, but it's illogical. Yeah, and it's like it, it, like the stuff they do to each other. Like normal people would die, but they never die from it. No. And it's just kind of like they can't get rid of each other. And there's like one routine at this very first tour where, uh, like at the end, because like Richie's got such a big debt, he's basically gonna off himself. But the way it's done is so funny that um, it basically they don't have a, an electric chair for Richie to off himself. So instead, uh. Eddie was planning for this moment the whole time because he was trying to get rid of Richie anyway. And years before, he developed the electric toilet. Uh, it's just literally a toilet. Where you pull the chain and it does the job. And um, then they find and then they find out that it's not just Richie's debt, it's Eddie's debt as well. So instead, like Eddie runs over and he goes, give me one of those effing electrodes and they strap themselves up. And as they pull the, as they pull the chain... It was like, come on, like, right, we're gonna go, we're gonna go together. Good night, everybody. Bang, and a massive explosion goes off, and that's the end of the show. It's brilliant. <laughs> oh dear, it's just such a bizarre series. But I think that's what makes British comedy the best. Is like the wackier it is, the more funny it can be. Yeah, but it's like the the relationship that Aid Edmondson and Rick Mail had. Like, we obviously, I'm sure, like you guys have seen Drop Dead Fred, like Young Ones at some point. The Young Ones is more popular than Bottom, but I think Bottom's better, in mm. my opinion. But uh, but also, it's just the relationship which they had together. You can tell they have such good chemistry together. And even when you see the behind the scenes clips, where there's all the bloopers and everything, you can tell they work so well together, and they know how to dance with one another basically so that was why it was such a shock to aid edmonton when rick mail died because i was like losing like a brother to him but they it was just there's there's very few partnerships in like comedy and in films where they just work so well together i think it's one of those things they always say that it's easier to form a friendship with somebody that you have to play against that you hate because you put all the time and effort into hating that person that all that there's left is them a friendship yeah, when it's the other way around, it's harder because it's harder to like somebody like over and over and over forcefully, and you end up just resenting that person because it's been said time again with certain actors in Hollywood that they've been forced to like certain people, but they're just absolute assholes and they just can't stomach it. Yeah, whereas like Rick Mail and Aid Edmondson absolutely love, absolutely they loved each other like as friends, like they were like proper brothers, like from all the behind the scenes stuff I've seen. But like there was like the stuff they used to get away with on stage, and it was just so like a lot of it was like not very on the nose. It was stuff they could get away with, like mm. the Queen, like the Queen stuff when he was trying to lose his virginity to the Queen. And then there was one where uh, it was in one of the in their fourth, it was in their fourth tour where they're stuck on. It was a it was like a part two to the number three where they're stuck on a just on a uh, on an island and they make this island their home. And oh no, it was in the third one. And like there was this friend, like this French frogman, like they it's the only chance they had to get off the island. And like he leaves an atomic bomb like in the middle of it on their island. And they and like Richie's like, well, why are they going to do an atomic uh, an atomic bomb test here? It's like because this is about as further away from France as you can get. And he says, let me see, what does it say on like? Let, let me read it. What does it say? La danger, la nuclear bomb. Oh crap! It's all in French. I can't read it. <laughs> It's just so stupid, but it's brilliant. Yeah, it's just uh, it's just so illogical that it's just worth the hassle. Yeah, but I encourage all you guys to watch Bottom. So without further ado, what would you say is probably a second for you, Ben? So this is a series I came across because it was reintroduced on Dave here in the UK a few years back. I knew about it kind of because my sister saw it growing up. 
my sister is six years older than me. And when this series first came out, my dad used to work night shifts. So he used to tape this TV series and watch it in the day with my six-year-old sister. This series is Red Dwarf. And <laughs> yes, like, it is definitely not a series you want a six-year-old to be watching. Because I was watching Little Britain at a young age. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, it's just like the the desired sort of insults that they have within Red Dwarf are ones that you really wouldn't want your little one to repeat, even though my six-year-old sister did. And the most common phrase within the series, please, YouTube, don't flag me for this, smeghead. It, <laughs> This is what this is what makes me laugh is that I got told this a few years ago that when my sister used to watch it with my dad that she learned the phrase smeghead at six years old. Yeah, although it's not although YouTube YouTube can't flag me for this, but there is actually a whole range of like toasters and kettles and so on and other electrical appliances for the kitchen which are called smeg. Yes. Yes. And then which... Every time I walk past that shop around like where because me and Ben don't live that far apart from each other. There's a shop just uh, in town where we live. And I, every time I walk past and I see, like, Smeg on a toaster, I'm like... <laughs> yeah, see, one of the... The thing is, within the whole scope of Red Dwarf, it's basically... It's set in the far-flung future, and you've got Dave Lister, who's an engineer on this space station, with his co-engineer, Arnold J. Rimmer. They are just basically the general maintenance people to make sure the ship runs right. And Dave Lister, being the lovable fool that he is, somehow snuck a cat on board that hadn't been decontaminated, which then meant that he had to be put in quarantine and the cat also put in quarantine. And as soon as he goes into quarantine, there ends up being a radiation leak, which causes the entire crew to die. So by random logic of the computer on the system, he puts Dave Lister into isolation till the radiation levels die down, which takes about a billion years. In which time, the cat has had so many babies over the period of time they've evolved into humanoid cat people, which is one of the other characters, which I love. And Arnold J. Rimmer obviously dies, but he gets re-brought back on one of the concepts on the ship as a hologram. And they have a few misadventures as just the three of them. And then later on, they bring in an idea of a robot butler called Crichton, who was played completely different to the guy that ended up being famous for it. But basically, Crichton was this robot who had malfunctioned. He thought that his previous owners are still alive. When they weren't, they'd been dead for like millions of years. So the lovable lot of Red Dwarf took him on, tried to help him out. And one of the main things in which Dave Lister loved to do was try to teach Crichton how to breach his programming. Because all the most logic of robotic beings is that you can't do any harm. For some reason, they're not allowed to swear. And he's trying to teach him how to independently think. So one of the running gags, gags within the series is that Crichton tries to call Rimmer a smeghead, but it always comes out as smrrrr, which is brilliant because it sounds like an old dial-up machine. Yeah. But I think one of my favourite scenes is where Dave is trying to teach Crichton how to lie. So he has in front of him a banana, and he goes, what's this? It's a banana. No, what is it? It's a banana. What is it? It's a... It's an... It's a Czechoslovakian um, patrol officer. And he goes through all these random things as he's like picking up stuff, like lying, and he gets really far. And then when Rimmer comes in, he like Dave goes, ah, Rimmer, look, I've taught crying how to lie. And he literally goes, okay then. And he goes... What's this? He goes, it's a banana. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what I found really amazing is that it wasn't, it might have been last year, if not the year before, they did continue on the story with Red Dwarf because they rebooted, kind of rebooted it, but brought it back. They had a break, then brought it back again, took a break, and did one other episode recently. And basically, on the ship, the ship's computer had malfunctioned and gone back to factory settings. 
because one of the other running gags was that the computer completely frazzled and just lost its marbles. But it's reset to back to normality. So what they had to do was that to get it back to what he used to be before he fried, sorry, when he had fried, if that makes sense, they had to find the reboot disc. I don't know how the hell they got the chance to make it so massive, but the backup drive was a floppy disk, like the size of like, well, as big that like, is up to the roof. Yeah. Like it was this monstrous floppy disk that they just went. Because the like, thing is, obviously, it was all technology from the 80s. So they didn't really predict a lot of modern tech now. But I love the fact that they kept the nostalgia, but the futuristic sci-fi yeah. in some weird degree. I mean, there's other things as well that it's just an absolutely lovable series, if a bit bonkers. But they've all done really well, despite being comedians. Like, you got the guy that plays Dave Lister, he went to Cory. The guy that played Cat was the original caretaker from MI High, which is another sci fi, like, yeah. kids series. You got the guy that played Rimmer, he's done loads of documentaries, and then the guy that played Crichton was the guy that did Scrappy Challenge. Yeah. But it's just a completely mad series regardless, but it's such a good one nonetheless. Oh yeah, I'm sure. What's your next one then, dude? Uh, next one, Brit- British classic, which we've all seen and is very popular, I found out, in India as well, mostly. And, like, everybody knows who this guy is. Rowan Atkinson as Mr. Bean. Oh, uh, yes. Mr. This... Bean It's just the only... I remember how, like, the actor Rowan Atkinson was told, I think when he was in drama school, that he would, like, never be a success. He would never amount to anything. And he managed to make the entire world laugh without speaking a single word. Yes. But the thing is, it was only one series. That's the most bizarre thing. It I was... know, but then you had loads of spin-off, like Mr. Bean's Holiday. Yes. You had... Um, what was what was the other one? Mr. Bean's Holiday, Mr. Bean: The Ultimate Disaster Movie, which is bloody brilliant. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was the other one when he, I think, when he went to France. I can't remember what was that. Mr. Bean? No, that was Mr. Bean's Holiday. But there was a few other random spin-offs, and then well, you can't class it as a spin-off, but it's the same actor, and it's my narrative, so Johnny English. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, but yeah, with the one series when you had like. This guy like getting himself into so many stupid situations, but yet manages to keep himself alive. And like he's completely insane, completely nuts. Like when he, um, there was probably my favorite episode of all time is when he gets the turkey stuck on his head at Christmas. <laughs> See, my favorite sketch that he did is when he's like trying to load everything up into his Mini Cooper. And he can't get in the car. So what he does is he makes a makeshift system. And this was in the days before health and safety. Rowan Atkinson basically cobbles together this like amalgamation of things from bro- brooms and a mop and an armchair and basically drives his car home while on, sitting on, the roof. on top. Yeah. yeah. But he's driving in the middle of London traffic, which for those of you who may not know, it is basically carnage plus like chaos plus cataclysmic hell all in one little bubble of a world yeah so imagine like imagine like maybe london with las with las vegas traffic (laughs) pretty much but it was just the fact that he even redid that when it came to i think it was a few years back he was doing a baftas award or something as like the guy doing the announcements for everyone so he turns up as mr bean in the car, literally driving it round London as he did before. Yeah. And it's just like, how the hell do you get away with this? I don't know. But there was like one of the other ones which really friggin' made me laugh is when Mr. Bean goes to the dentist because he's got to have a procedure done on one of his teeth. And uh, yeah, like the, um, it was like the doctor who was going to give him like an inject, was going to give him an injection in his mouth to numb his mouth. But then he gets a phone call and he just walks off and like Mr. Bean grabs the syringe and because it's so stupid, he starts like playing with it, going like squirting it, going, Oh, that's quite cool, you know, yeah. just like squirting it. And then the doctor comes back in the room and he can't put it back, so he has to hide it down by his leg. And then the doctor start the dentist starts poking around in his mouth and Mr. Bean, he has a little bit of a jolt and he accidentally stabs the numbing syringe into the doctor's leg. And so the guy's like leg goes all numb and he falls on the floor, passed out. He does a whole procedure on his teeth himself. 
Yeah. It's it's just brilliant. It's fantastic. But this thing is there was not I think even the people within the episodes didn't really speak much. I think you had like the odd word or two from them. I mean, there's even the episode where he goes on a date and the woman doesn't say a thing throughout the entire no. thing. But like they they go to a movie together and it plays the dramatic jaws. Do, 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 do. And he's like, Bruh! and everyone jumps like everyone's scared oh, yeah, out of the popcorn. Like, yes. <laughs> oh god. The thing is, like the guy didn't have to say a word. I think the only word he ever said like was Teddy Hello. said and, like, words here and there, but. Uh, I tell you what, the other one of my other favorite sketches he did was it was like around Christmas time where it's like New Year's party and he forwards the time ahead. So, either, no, so the people in the party forward it ahead because they don't want to be stuck with him because it's a crap party. Yeah. The next day, obviously, Mr. Bean wants to do some decorating. So he decides there's a way to cop out. He fills this paint can full of dynamite, sets it alight, closes the door. And it does do a decent job. You see this lovely bright white room. The entire like place is covered in paint. He's taken away the newspaper that's covering everything it should. And then you turn and pan and you see this just outline of a person going. Uh. <laughs> it's just, oh, it's yeah, brilliant. It was one of the guests that came back in for his hat. And you see like the. And he was still drunk the from the night before. Hat, like in paint. <laughs> yeah. But he's still drunk from the night before, which I love because I'm. I want to know, like, if I was in that frame of mind, would I even notice that I got covered in paint or what? I don't know. But there's another one. It's like, again, it's my narrative. Uh, yeah. But you have, like, Rowan Atkinson. If you just watch Rowan Atkinson live, uh, where he does loads of, like, sketches and everything, he does a few Mr. Bean things as well, yeah. which it's not completely Rowan Atkinson just acting. But hearing Rowan Atkinson, like, Mr. Bean swear is really friggin' weird. <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing is, is, like, because Mr. Bean was the first series I'd seen Rowan Atkinson in, I just always assumed that that's how he spoke. But it's yeah. not. He's a very well-spoken man, but he's very good at playing a very stupid, idiotic buffoon. Oh, yeah, because in reality, when Rowan Atkinson like, was even as stupid in Johnny English as well, like he would never have been hired by MI6, never. <laughs> oh, no, of course not. I think he'd probably be, at the very least, be hired to just like shred documents, and that's about it. Yeah, so like that's Mr. Bean. Like, I'm sure everybody knows of Mr. Bean. I don't really have to go much into that. And if you've never seen Mr. Bean, where have you been all your life? Where have you been? And then we swiftly move on to, uh, well, these will probably be our last ones for this top three, but I'm sure we'll probably do more because it's bloody loads of them. So, what would probably be your third, your top three? So, this series I will happily watch time and time again. It's utter nonsense. I don't know how the hell they got away with it because it was about 40 years after World War II, which sounds a long time, but it really isn't in terms of history. It's a low, a low. <laughs> like, this series was basically around the whole concept of war wartime France. There was this cafe owner called René Artois who basically got coerced in working with the French resistance, even though he didn't want anything to do with it, to become this guy that was basically their intelligence guy between the English and the French, while also appeasing to the Germans, and lots of mayhem ensued from there. And it was just absolute nonsense. Like, like you got... One of the main things was that René Artois was a bit of a ladies' man, shall we say. He was happily married, although technically not happy, but he was married... And he was having an affair with not one, but two of his waitresses. One of them got written out for whatever bizarre reason. I think she just didn't like being in it anymore. But you'd have like these random, oh, René, like really passionate French accent. Like, oh, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> and it was over the top accents, which was brilliant nonetheless. But then they decided to bring in the idea of a British intelligence officer who could speak French that would come in and pretend to be a French policeman to try and work with the resistance to try and speed things up. But the gag of it was that he was able to speak French, but not well, in terms that every word that he said ended up being the wrong word. And it just went horribly wrong from there. 
So you'd have, oh God, what was his name? Uh, I can't remember his name now, but basically it'd be the it'd be like good morning instead of good morning, and I was pissing by the window instead of passing by the window. <laughs> it was just simple things like that that always got me, and I don't know why. But one of the main things throughout the entire series, despite the fact that it was all about war, they seem to have found a way of around it all by looking into how dodgy the Germans were by basically having them obsessed over some certain artwork by a artist known as Van Klom. And he basically made a painting called The Fallen Madonna with the um, Big Boobies. <laughs> and... <laughs> It was this throughout the entire series. They had to hide it. They had. They would try to sell it. They hide it. They tried to sell it. And one thing they ended up doing towards the end was that they basically got it back together again because it got slightly broken. And Rennie basically ran away with this mistress and had his happy ending. But the other thing as well is there were two other British men to a degree within the series, but they didn't speak a lick of English. But they were so over the top English. It was hit it up. Like it was brilliant. Was it, because... like, it was like kind of back then the stereotypical English, what people yes. thought English people will sound it like. Yes, because I can't remember what the other one was, but I know one of them was called Carsters. So you go, I say Carsters, this food tastes funny. <laughs> and it was just absolute nonsense. Like I'm sure to a degree some of it was a bit iffy for historical facts, regardless, but You'd have, like, Rene's wife was also the lounge singer for the cafe who couldn't sing a note. Ironically, the actress could actually sing. She was, like, a really well-known opera singer. But for the series, she just made it seem like she couldn't sing a note whatsoever just to make things worse. <laughs> I mean, there are some moments within the whole scope of the series I think was a bit iffy at the very least. Like, there was some very sexualized content within the series where you have Helga, the um, German recruit who was in it with one of the members of the Gestapo called Herr Flick, which I love as a pun on a name because obviously most German people went by Herr if it was like a bureaucracy type thing, I think. Uh, I, I, I freaking speak German, so I should know this. But like, uh, like kind of when they would say like her and then like saw their title or like yeah. her and like it was kind of like it depended on like the situation you were in and like how you were trying to explain who someone was in a way. But it was just the fact that it was her flick was just <laughs> it, it was just such a subtle joke, but it makes a lot of sense. But then he ends up getting an assistant. But the thing I think probably sold it the most was the fact that everyone in the Gestapo had a limp. I don't know why. And I think they explained it in the series that they basically, when they get indoctrinated into being part of the Gestapo, once they've had their training and they've like fully passed, they have their leg like broken or something. So they end up having a limp. That's why all of them end up limping. That's so stupid. I know. But like, there's so many things. Like Helga, it, like she first flirts with him just to like get information, but then she ends up falling in love with him. So it gets to the point where she gets more and more sexualized clothing hidden underneath her army uniform throughout the series. There's one bit of a scene that was listed recently as a bit too extreme, where she's wearing a corset that's got um, swastikas on it, on the tassels. Uh, and I don't know if that would fly today. But... Well, no, but this is it. Like, it was quite an iffy thing, regardless. But it's, the majority of the series was that both, so many characters were just shagging one another that I'm surprised they got anything done. I'm surprised Fran France managed to liberate themselves. <laughs> Jesus wept. But I think the most complicated part of the whole series was that. Within the first episode, Rene has to be shot to death because he gets caught out by the German police for working with the French resistance. So he has to fake his death, but he still has to be part of the French resistance. So he pretends to be his own twin brother 
And so for the first two series, he's trying to get back the rights to the cafe because in his will, he leaves it to his wife. But because he's legally dead, he has no ownership. It's his wife who, who has it. So he's trying to get back the cafe so he can end up having money to run away with one of his mistresses. He hasn't decided who. But the shorter one of the two, she ends up being written out eventually. And then she gets recast by someone else as a different character who's a French resistance woman, who's a very short, blonde, feisty woman by the name of Mimi Mimi LeBlanc. (laughs) But it's so (laughs) funny. This this girl is probably barely five foot tall. Everyone's like six foot, give or take. And like the Germans come along. And she ends up kneeing them in the bollocks every so often. And it's so funny. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, I think <sighs> Gruber is a bit of an iffy one for today's standard because he was very flamboyant. He was very homosexual in his like advances to Rene, which I don't think would fly very well today. No, because I think it's kind of, it wasn't because back then it wasn't really a thing you sort of well, spoke about, but now yeah. obviously we have gay pride and everything like that, and it's completely fine now. But back then it was still a bit of a thin line to walk, then. Mm. But it was just such a good series, nonetheless. I mean, they had so many random actors within it that had big roles from prior things, but they just did such a good ensemble of people. Yeah. But. Yeah, I think that's my list concluded. What's your final one? The final one has to be my all-time favourite. I have seen every episode a good thousand times. Started watching it when I was really, 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 really young. And I think I remember I got in trouble like with my mum because I like said one of the jokes or whatever or one of the gags. I can't it was only Fours and Horses, my favourite thing of all time. So like Del Boy, Rodney, Grandad, or later on Uncle Albert. Uh, and it's just... The main shtick, the whole shtick of this thing is this time next year will be millionaires. And it's said at least once in every single episode, I think. Yeah. And like they've had, and this series ran for, I think, about eight, 1983 all the way to 2003. Mm-hmm. Um, because they did three episodes in 2003 where like they lost all their money and everything when they finally became millionaires, which I don't know why they did that because you wanted them to be millionaires so badly. And you just think, just let them have their victory lap, let them live rich and everything. But they had so many opportunities to be rich, and they tried to come up with all these crazy get rich quick schemes, which always failed. But they failed so gracefully; it was brilliant. They were like market traders, and like they were selling like knockoff gear and everything like that. But it's just the way it's done is just so brilliant and so funny. It's just master comedy. And there was, um, I think, one of my fa- like one of the most favorite gags which they ever had is um, it's it was like a it was a like a long episode it was like an hour or so it's called to hull and back mm-hmm. where basically they had to smuggle there i think they had to smuggle diamonds over to amsterdam and uh yeah they like ended up having to like rent a trawler and everything like that and uncle albert's trying to sail them across the bloody ocean and it's an absolute <laughs> nightmare they get to amsterdam finally because uh boise their rich mate who's like an absolute ponce you know who's just like a poncy rich person who they're mates with and uh yeah, sent him over to Amsterdam with like a uh, a suitcase full of money, and then they have to get the diamonds and everything, pays him the money and everything like that. And um, I've found some way or another, in some way or another, they get the diamonds and everything. They get the diamonds and everything. I think they get some money as well. Um, and so they get the diamonds and so on, and they bring them back to London and everything like that. Skip to Boise and everything, and. When they get um, when they get back, they got Slater, who's a copper who they used to go to school with. But co- he's a copper who tried to nick Dell in the past, which I'll get into that story a little bit later on. But um, and he was trying to he's trying to nick Dell because he knew about this diamond smuggling scheme because he was involved in it the whole time. He was trying to get money for his retirement out of the diamond smuggling scheme, like absolute git. And so and so like Dell, he puts the diamonds down on the table. And he was just like, come on, boys, you put your money, put the money down. We're going to do it like the same time. And as they're about to grab, like the coppers burst in through the doors. And uh, so it's uh, Slater ends up taking the diamonds and everything. Everybody's pretty much lost everything. Everybody's all buggered. 
They think, oh, we've basically we've gone all this way, done all these crazy missions, tried, nearly got nicked and everything for nothing, been all the way to Amsterdam, the lot. But when they get back home, Dale ends up, Rodney finds out that Uncle Albert was hiding two of the diamonds in his pipe and takes them out and everything. He's like, right, we'll get probably, like, they're probably about worth three grand each. And so they're going to sell them and everything like that. And Rodney goes, actually, we've got a little bit more money than that. And he finds out that uh, the money which Boise threw on the table, which he thought Slater, the copper, nicked, actually Rodney took it. And so he's got like 30 grand of Boise's money and everything. And it was just like, and Dale like takes off and goes, you know what we're going to do with this money, don't you, Rodney? He's like, yes, we're going to invest it. Or should we go on holiday? Should we go to Benidorm? He's like, no, I'm going to show you what we're going to do with it. And then he throws the money straight out of the window. And you have Rodney, like, with a massive, like, shock look on his face. And he was, like, pretty much certain that his, the money was a complete dud, only to find out that the money is actually real, but everybody's pretty much taken it on the estate. So, like, there's so many times when they have the opportunity to be rich and they always screw it up. But the way it's done, it's just absolutely fabulous. It's brilliant. But there's another one where uh, Del Boy, he's nearly nicked for basically taking some knockoff uh, microwaves from the back of a lorry yeah. and um, like trying to sell them like on the market for like, I like they usually retail at 60 pound. I'm going to let you have them for like 15 quid or something like that. And um, he ends up getting immunity from prosecution for him and uh, his family. And um, he gets immunity from prosecution and he finds this loophole to try and screw Slater over where he can say exactly who nicked the microwave but he won't get prosecuted or anything. So he's got immunity from prosecution. He goes, come on. He, after like hours of grilling him and interrogating his family and everything, he goes, come on, Dale, who nicked it? And he goes, I did, but he's already signed the immunity from prosecution. The way it's done and executed is just fabulous. Thing is, it's such a British concept that people coming from nothing, trying to build something for themselves to try and be something, I think that's what sold the series the most. Like Because they're every like everyday people. Yeah, like, they lived in a high-rise tower within London. They were the most like, dodgy like people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's so many other things. The character mix as well was quite good. I mean, the, my favourite one is when you got Trigger, who isn't the most intelligent of characters. Well, Dave, yeah, like, he's a bit... I don't know what the word is. Like, I would say and, and, like, lacking brain cells. Like, Rodney Day for some reason. And it's yeah. referenced in one of the episodes going... Trigger, why would you call me Dave? My name's not Dave, my name's Rodney. Oh, I thought it was Dave. No, it's not. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes, on so my birth certificate, my passport, everything. It's definitely Rodney. Oh, all right, well, I have to stop calling you Dave then. Yeah, thank you. And then he looks at his mate and goes, Oh, but as we're going to get on with this meeting, me and Dave ain't got all night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was a bit of a simpleton. Like, he didn't have many big roles within the series, but he helped it move a lot. Broomstick? Ah, oh, it's my favourite joke because it's such a simple joke, but it makes you think nonetheless. He basically yeah, he's, he's talking to Boise, I think, isn't it? Where he's, yeah, he's talking he's, to Boise and he's talking he, to like Dell and everybody, yeah. And he's saying about the fact that oh, I've had the same broom all these years. I mean, I've swapped the broom handle and I've swapped the brush over the years, but it's still the same brush that's still working. And they both oh, yeah, look at him and look at each other. And they just sort of like, but is it still the same broom then? And he goes, well, of course it is. Like, it's been the same broom I've had ever since. Oh, yeah, was it? This broom has had, like, 15 new heads and 12 brand new <laughs> handles in its time. And you have, like, the guy who runs the cafe is going, well, how can it be the same bloody broom then? He's like, well, here's yes. a picture of it. What more proof do you want? <laughs> <laughs> but it's just such a simple joke. But it just, I don't know how it makes me laugh so much. It's just such an easy idea for a joke. Yeah. Because I think it was in that same episode, or maybe a different one, where uh, no, it's in the same episode where Del and Rodney dress up as Batman and Robin for a fancy oh, dress party, yes. and uh, they dress up for a fancy dress party, you know, thing like that, because uh, their wives or girlfriends are away, and uh, just like yeah, everybody's going to be in fancy dress, it's all going to be good, and everything like that. So they all dress up as Batman and Robin, like from the nineteen sixties, uh, and so they dress up in costume and everything like that, but. Boise didn't tell them that the guy who organised the party actually died and it was actually his wake. But they but they sent a fax machine to 
they sent a fax to Dell when they used to do faxes back then. But obviously, because it's Dell, he's got a dodgy machine because it probably fell off a lorry. So he didn't get the message. So they're the only ones that turn up in costume. And everybody's in black suit and tie and everything because it's Harry's, like, it's their mate Harry's wake. And so everybody's all sat around mourning, sad and everything, consoling each other. And they burst through the door with silly string, silly string going, da 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 And like Boise goes right up to him like, and goes, Dell, Harry died yesterday. And he's like, well, why didn't you tell? Why didn't you tell us that outside instead of letting us burst in like that? I was like, oh, it just slipped my mind. It's strange what grief can do, and he just starts wetting himself laughing. <laughs> See, that episode is probably one of the most iconic ones of all because within that episode, the Trotter's van, which was a reliant Robin, breaks down. If I remember right, yeah, it breaks down like the middle of town, <laughs> and it causes a lot of smoke, and then it randomly transfers to this random scene down an alleyway where this black woman starts getting mugged by these yoppy teenager thugs and then out of this smokiness you see Rodney and Delbert and it's just so funny because everybody just stops and the woman just goes I have no clue because the guy's like who the hell are you and they just leg it but What's happening? Like, because it's funny, they're, they're trying to rob this woman and then they all just stop and freeze where they are. They go, what's happening? It's idea. Just... And then you see them running down the street. <laughs> it's just such an iconic series. I mean, they have done a lot of things in between. Like, the guy that played Rodney, he had a comedy series before or maybe during... Um... Nicholas Lindhurst. Yeah, during Only Falls, where he was a time traveller of sorts and basically had two separate lives, where he could go to the past and stay in the present. And they tried bringing it back a few years ago, but it just didn't work for some reason for modern day. But Uh, And then you had, uh, like, David Jason, who was in Last of the Summer's Wine, which was, like, his own series with Catherine Zia-Jones. And then he did A Touch of Frost years later, which was, like, a more serious sort of crime drama. Yeah, and then he was in Open All Hours, which surprisingly oh. seemed to have worked in modern day. Like, even though I love Open All Hours, I work in retail, I could tell you better stories than they have ever had in that show itself. But, like, it still works in modern day because, like, it was just the sheer nonsense of a shop owner that was just too stubborn and too tight. Oh, yeah, because he was like a Ponzi like type shopper, like Ronnie Barker. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's pretty much summed up this week's episode. Finally, we've got some idea of how to make Twitch work. Yeah, because we, I think we've done this twice now, and this is the third attempt trying to do it. Yeah. But for the next topic, it's going to be me talking about something. And while it's going to be a bit of a bizarre choice, I've seen some leaked images for it, which looks pretty damn good so far. I want to talk about the live-action version of Powerpuff Girls coming to America. Oh. While I know it's going to be cringy as hell... Who cares? It, it's going to be something interesting for our own childhood to see how it translates to the live-action screen, because they've chosen some reasonable people so far. I'm a bit unsure as to why Donald Fajan, a.k.a. Dirk... Uh, Donald Turk from um, Scrubs is Professor Utonium, but we'll have to wait and see how that works. Yeah, we'll just have to spe- we'll just have to speculate for now, but that's going to be the subject of next week, which hopefully at the weekend, because the weekend seems to be cursed at the minute when we try mm. to scream. Yes, but we shall give it a go, and yeah, again, it's been nice to see you all. Stay safe, stay home, and we'll see you all soon. See you later.